load paths. So we're going to have a look at what what are they essentially and why are they important. Um, it's essentially how the load travels through the structure to get to its final destination. This is often the ground in most situations, but if you're looking at isolated elements, it might be back to the, the remainder of the structure or the stability system. And they enable us to work out how the structure itself works and how it will behave. And we can then make accurate estimates of how we will then carry out our, our side of the job. Incorrect assumptions on load paths can cause serious issues. As you could imagine, if you've assumed an incorrect load path or there's been the archive drawings are inaccurate, then you could assume a load path that's incorrect. And this can cause serious instabilities, cracking, or ultimately collapses. So it is really important to understand how loads are transmitted. And if you are interrupting the load path, how they will get down to the ground eventually. So we'll first talk about the demolition side and then we'll go on to the construction side, but the S6187 talks quite a lot about load paths. It is the, the code of practice for demolition. So it looks at how they change regularly. And you can see some of the bits here in floors 5.2 and 9.22 on things that can cause unplanned um, collapses. So it highlights here why load paths are really important for temporary works engineers. There's, it's a residual risk that these will be interrupted during demolition of complex structures and during cut and carve works. It crops up a number of times, as you can see there, and it's understandable because with demolition, we'll quite often not have full information available on the structures we are demolishing. It'll be based on some archive drawings, some site investigation, some opening up works. And yeah, this is why it's a lot more complicated in old structures than new structures. So it also mentions the load paths in section 14, where it states that any demolition should be based on a complete understanding of the nature of the structure, the independence of the elements and the relationships between these. And that is essentially saying that knowing the load paths is essential to enable the kind of looking at the interrelationships between the elements. And this brings us on to our favorite slide that I believe we get in almost every webinar now, which is that if we don't have the knowledge or the knowledge about the structure to start with, the temporary works design that we're providing will not be very good. So the garbage in, garbage out philosophy. So it's obvious that we need that understanding at the start, and that might come from a variety of places, which we'll come on to in a bit. So what types of loading are we going to be considering when we're thinking about our our load paths. So they can broadly be split into two. You've got your vertical loads and your lateral loads. Your vertical loads will be from a combination of self weight and variable imposed loads. These might be kind of plant loading and demolition, construction live loads, and or environmental loads such as snow. And then your lateral loadings could be due to both gravity as well, you're out of plumb, or your kind of notional horizontal, and also your lateral loads due to wind loads or kind of hydraulic earth pressure loads. And these will be transmitted down to the ground in a different way to your vertical loads. We also need to consider the combination of these loads and how that combination can act together to cause the worst case loading on a structure. So, Looking at conventional load paths, so the diagram there is a pretty simple structure, really. You've got a two-way spanning slab, which is supported by beams, which then transmit the load down through the columns to the foundations, where there is hopefully an equal and opposite reaction from the ground, otherwise you'll have an issue. So this is at the most simple end of how your load path will be when you're demolishing a structure. Similar here, domestic application, but yet again, you've got your roof loads being transmitted down through the walls. There's some beams there. 
and further kind of retaining walls and then your foundations and the ground reacting against it. So in practice, how does this look? So in this situation, we've got um, some concrete floor slabs, I imagine, onto some steel beams, both primary and secondary beams that transmit the load back towards the columns and then down towards the foundations. And this is cumulative floor on floor. So you get that kind of addition of load onto your columns as you work your way down. The same applies in simple temporary work schemes. So you've got some cut line propping in a cut and carve job that we did. You've got, it is a two-way spanning floor there. It's a waffle slab, but the side that is um, unsupported is supported by the props or the, the um, super slim soldier there, which transmits the load out to the props which come down to the foundations. And then you've also got to have that equal and opposite reaction from the ground or the slab in this case, which is providing support to the whole system. So these are your more conventional load paths. So onto unconventional load paths, and this is more on the temporary work side. And what I'm gonna be discussing here is kind of also why it's important for engineers designing things to understand the load paths because when you have a, an FEA or a finite element analysis model, you need to make sure that is working correctly and understanding how those loads are transmitted through your structure will help you be able to sense check your models and do some kind of fag packet calcs on what loads or deflector shape you're expecting. And that will kind of feed into your, your engineering judgment, be able to check these structures accurately. So what I'm going to talk about here is a bit of like a very, fairly standard tower crane grillage and how the loads from that tower crane are transmitted to the foundations. So most tower cranes, well, will have, they'll all have a vertical load. They'll have a moment applied to them. They'll also have horizontal loads due to the kind of the lateral loading from wind. And there will probably also be a torque. Well, there will be a torque moment from the slewing when in service. So you've got a lot of independent loads which are applied to the structure in a combined load case. And it's useful to break those loads down to understand exactly how your structure will react and think about where the forces are going and how they're being transmitted. So firstly, this is a grillage we designed ages ago. I can't remember where, to be honest, but it had a nice picture and it was a nice simple design just to show this, this concept. So we've got some vertical loads that we're applying here and they're transmitted pretty obviously through the main beams back to the support uh, in major axis bending outwards there and it's transmitted into the structure through bearing. Um, when you look at the moment, so your moment is caused by an eccentricity of the self-weight when you're looking at like in-service moments and out-of-service moments are also caused by the lateral load due to the wind. And these can be applied in any direction on a crane. So this is with the crane leaning towards us. You'll have uplift on your back legs, compression on your front legs. And this will be transmitted back to the, the supports in major axis bending as well but you'll have hogging moments and you'll have tension at your supports. There may also be some moments in the connecting beams and the bracing due to that differential movement, depending on the, the connection details. When you look at the horizontal loads, so these will be applied at the top of your beam and will be transmitted through minor axis bending. These can be applied in any direction again and in this direction, minor axis bending will be the dominant load transmitting kind of concept. If it was left to right, it would be axial force. You'd get tension and compression in those main beams, and then it'd be transmitted at the supports through friction. And finally, you'd have a torque load, and that's transmitted in a very similar way to the horizontal loads through a combination of minor axis bending and axial capacity. You'll also possibly get some tension or compression in your plan bracing, depending on the stiffness of that to your, to your main beams. Because these loads are applied at the top of your girders, you'll also need to transmit that force from the, the top of your girder level down to your kind of bearing level. 
And this is done through the bracing and the connecting members, which provide that lateral restraint to your beams. So why I'm talking about this is because most grillages, when they start to get more complicated, will be designed using FEA software because there's so many different load cases as the crane slew is 360, and you want to provide the worst case, especially with non-standard shapes, which are a bit more complicated than this square one. So you'll need to be able to understand is the model that you've got there actually showing what you expect it to? Is it running correctly? And looking at your, your moment diagrams, your axial force diagrams, your deflected shape, and being able to interpret if that's working correctly will be what enables you to do that. And this is, I guess, why I'm going on about load paths a lot in the, the temporary work side and being able to analyze an FEA model to check it is working correctly. <clears throat> so going back to demolition, how do we understand what the load path is? What we've got on the right is a fairly simple model or a fairly simple problem where you are looking to put a door lintel in. But even a, a simple job like that might have quite complicated load paths. So in this situation, we've got an opening above it already. Um, so there is some self-weight of the masonry to either side. You've also got a beam coming down onto a pad stone. And it looks like to the right, there is, there's an arch. So you've got the thrust force of an arch. This would be quite hard to see prior to the soft strip. So what we need to be looking at is making sure you have an understanding of structures. You've got previous experience or you're kind of asking questions of more senior engineers when you're a junior engineer to see you understand exactly how these structures work. Um, reviewing archive drawings is a big one, though you've got to make sure or verify that your archive drawings are what is on site. Quite often there's been alterations, the load path may have been changed by previous renovation works, and what you've got as a drawing isn't strictly correct. So to do this, breakouts in a structure, well, firstly, soft strip in the structure so you can see the structural elements will help, and any breakouts where there's inconsistencies to confirm that will also be useful. It's good to have a walk over the site post soft strip to kind of understand that the structure as shown in any archive drawings is accurate. And that's, that's an important part of an engineer's job. So what needs to be considered? This is a little bit of a, a summary here. So how is the current structure standing up? If you're looking at a cut and carve job, what, what is the current load paths? Are you ripping out the existing lift cores and stairwells that provide that lateral stability? How is that load getting down to the foundations? If there's any settlement, and this is more to do with if you're doing kind of cut line propping, if you get settlement in your structure due to any propping, how will that affect the load paths? Are you gonna be overstressing certain elements by having settlement in others? So do you need a preload? How do you transfer the load from the temporary to the permanent structure and also vice versa from the permanent to the temporary structure? This comes back to kind of propping schemes. Do you need to preload it to take some of it or to transfer the stress? And yeah, that, that kind of thing there is where is your load transfer coming from and what is the kind of the important elements? Overall stability of the structure. If you're making your structure into Swiss cheese, which is what quite often happens with kind of cut and carve things, there's lots of openings going in. It's really important to understand how your lateral stability is maintained and how your vertical loads are transferred down to the ground to make sure that um, there's not excessive vertical stress or lateral stress being transferred because of these openings. And then we also need to look at load history and the interface between the new structure and the old. Is there any stage in the permanent works construction that's not actually covered by the permanent works design? So normally if you're going kind of bottom up with your construction, you'll be building the stability mechanism as well as the rest of the structure. 
if your structure is kind of a phase construction where certain bits are going up before others, is the stability mechanism going up at the same rate as the rest of the structure? Is there a requirement for temporary bracing? How, how is the load path and the temporary structure maintained prior to it getting to its finished state? So that's what we're kind of talking about there and why that should be considered. It should be part of the kind of permanent works phasing to kind of identify if there are any issues when that comes up, but it's useful to have that early engagement from contractors and temporary works engineers to identify these issues prior to them becoming critical. So ask yourself finally, is it buildable? Has it been considered for the whole seek or has the load path been considered for the whole sequence? So a little bit before we move on to the case studies, a little bit on load history. It's not strictly load path, but it does link into the whole kind of concept of understanding how your load is being transmitted. So what we've got here is a, a fairly simple example just to illustrate the point. What you're looking to do is you're going to be casting a, an RC beam into an existing RC column with a structure above it. So the green is the new bit, the gray is the existing. And at the moment, the load is fairly concentrically loading that column. You've got an even stress distribution, assuming there's no moments on it. To enable this construction of the new beam, you break out part of your column. Now the load from that beam is being transmitted through the remaining section of your column. So you've got higher stress in that section. Then you be or yeah, the new beam is cast into it. You've got your elbows in and you cast your concrete into that. Now, in this new section, where is the existing stress from the residual dead load? So that's still transmitted down the older gray bit of column. There's still that higher stress distribution. If there was now further stress applied to that column, where does that go? So in that situation, you've still got a higher stress in the existing column. Any new stress would be evenly distributed between the new and the old, but there is still the possibility that you will exceed the capacity of that older section because of that load history. This is really hard to identify in a lot of old structures due to kind of works done previously. So it's something that really needs a bit of thought put into it when you're kind of looking at old structures, carrying out demolition works or temporary works associated with it. So on to our case study. So I think first we're going to go with Richard, who I'm hoping is still on the meeting. I am. The very astute of you will have noticed I dropped out for a minute about 10 minutes ago, so I hope I don't drop out again while I'm talking. Uh, so today, fortunately, Dave's already mentioned, I'm going to talk about a cut and carve job that we did in London. So this building, as you can see here, has about 18 columns throughout the structure that give it stability. You can see the columns there on the very right of the first picture you can see there's a tower there as well and uh, if you click back dave sorry you can see in the top left and bottom right there is these square towers now when we were looking at this job we naturally assumed these towers would give stability to the structure but going out to site and actually looking at them you could see that in places they weren't connected to the structure at all so if you click forward, Dave, you can see that these really big columns throughout the structure were the only thing really giving it stability in most places. So these big columns were far more oversaturated because they were designed to reduce vibration, not just take the loads. But you can see from this load path that I drew up that all the loads go back to the columns in a pretty neat pattern there that avoids these top and bottom towers completely. However, if you click forward, Dave, we needed to carve out these massive chunks in the structure so that new cores could go in. And you can see that they're pretty sizable chunks of the building being cut out. So the first thing that we need to look at is how does this structure work? 
So as it is, you can see the load in the top picture there. The load is pretty easy to identify and it goes pretty uniformly towards these columns. Uh, but if you look at the lower one, that shows that the loads now go all over the place and where we've made the big holes. So by using this, we can identify the places where the stresses have changed and might need some propping. Some places, the stresses don't look like they need propping, but it does require some common sense when you're looking at it. So in the very middle of it there, you've got two, a line of props and a prop tower there. The stresses don't show as an increase compared to the first uh, model that we did, but nothing else will be holding up those sections of slab. So we have to be very careful when we're looking at the structure. We look at it in a holistic way and know where the loads are just now, how the loads are transferred through the structure and where we need to put props to ensure that none of these slabs will fall down. So if you click to the next slide, Dave. So in the end, this is where we put all our props. Now, this is over three different levels. We have, it wasn't back propping because it was all just propped because these holes were on every level because there were cores. So it was an accumulative load down these props. And we made sure to have them arranged in this exact same position all the way through the structure. It was only two stories when we were doing this propping, but those three levels of propping had to be in a straight line. Otherwise, it would the load would go back to the slab and might not be supported properly. So if you don't move on yet, and if you go back, Dave, go back, there we go. So around that central core, you get a lot of slab that is hanging and not uh, held up by anything except for these props. But the load distribution didn't show that because it didn't have much except for its own dead load. So in that central one that's highlighted as detail E, and I didn't put the detail in, but that wasn't held up by anything except for these props for quite some time. And if you move on now, Dave, very well, very well rehearsed this, you can tell. Uh, now, those towers that were standing by themselves, one of the towers was to have an additional lift pit put in, which added all kinds of drama and extravagance to this job as well. So initially, you can see it's a vertical load path, as Dave was talking about earlier. The loads just go from the top to the bottom. The existing structure around it did add some lateral stability, but that was that was dealt with completely separately from this load path. And if you move on, Dave, you can see these big blue blocks at the bottom is where we wanted to put in a new lift pit and some underpinning. And you can see the load path as exists goes right into those blue box. So that was not ideal. So what we ended up coming up with is this extravagant propping scheme. Now, this propping scheme was needed because if you look at where the openings are in the tower, you most of the load will go to the corners of these towers. So in the corner of the towers, you still need the underpinning. But if you dig down there, you might destabilize the self-standing tower because you don't get the stability from the rest of the structure. And if you move on once, Dave. So the load path comes down from the top still and we installed these props in that opening in the front section to allow the load to be transferred from the existing structure into our proposed propping scheme and then thank you and then from these props the load goes through a system of beams and then it goes out from the beams into stub columns that we created for this and into some very nicely placed piles from the rest of the permanent works that just happened to be very close to where we needed them to be 
So this changed from a very nice straight load path that went straight down the tower to a load path that goes down the tower into some props, into some beams, into some more beams, into some columns, and then into some piles. But that meant that the tower was self-supporting and you could just dig out below it with the usual digging precautions. But you can just dig out below it without having to worry about the weight of the rest of the tower. And if you move on again, Dave... And that's Church Monks. And that is not me anymore, so I'll pass it on to Vorchek. Yeah, so so Vorchek's just going to have a quick chat here about a job we did earlier this year, uh, a footbridge design, which gives a good illustration of load reversal. So I'll let you run, run with it. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Church Monks footbridge, which was a part of Wessex footbridges. Um, we were working for Sam Evans and Sons, and the principal contractor for the works was, was Balfour Beauty, BT. Uh, our scope of works involved uh, uh, demolition sequencing, track protection, and analysis of the bridge in temporary condition. Uh, and I think it's a good example of the reversal of load paths in the temporary condition. Um, so as we can see, um, there are quite of great importance when dealing with temporary works. Uh, actions as simple as lifting out of the existing bridge must be given some thought. Uh, as at the first glance, we might say that since the support points are closer together, we will have a lower bending moment when lifting. Uh, this, of course, is a valid point. However, we also need to understand the new support conditions. As we pick up the bridge, the ends will sag, which means that we will have hogging moment at the lifting points. Um, the stress distribution in the cross section will therefore be reversed, putting the top half in tension and the bottom half in compression. Um, this is especially important when materials such as cast iron are used, uh, which have different tension and compression capacities, which is often the case with older bridges. Um, and uh, we also need to consider uh, changing restraint conditions of the flanges, as they might be different at the top to the bottom. Um, and as we often deal with corroded or dilapidated structures, we need to consider the reductions in the cross-sectional area, uh, damaged or damaged connections, which could uh, result in a reduced resistance of the members. And once all the factors mentioned have been considered, we can provide a successful design as we have done in this case. Thank you. Right, so just to summarize here, so what we're looking for is understand the structure really for when we start a, a demolition or a temporary work scheme understand the sequence of either construction or demolition and therefore understand the problem these things will lead us to get the right solution this applies to all engineering kind of disciplines in to do with temporary works but understanding how your loads are transmitted through structures and how that will change due to what you're doing to it is really really important to to getting the right solution.